Hi, Chris. Hi, Bob. How are you doing? Good. Good. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available via both streaming video and audio podcast. Two options. Two options, Chris. That's the free, mar- that's <laughs> the free market at work, by the way. That is the free market at work. You're absolutely We're right. Get, the people get what they want. Now, I should tell people, you are at the Libertarian Cato Institute, but unlike many people at the Cato Institute, you don't really spend a lot of time talking about uh, the virtues of free markets as they apply domestically, at least, because you're a foreign policy guy. You are the vice president for defense and foreign policy studies. Correct. The Cato, and you've written a new book called Peace, War, and Liberty, Understanding U.S. Foreign Policy. That's Not right. to be confused with older books of yours, such as The Power Problem, How American Military Dominance Makes Us Less Safe, Less Prosperous, and Less Free. And with that subtitle, people may get a sense of the fact that you defy any stereotypes that may be floating around about conservatism being right. inherently associated with a militaristic, hawkish foreign policy. Well, I certainly hope that's what I was doing with that subtitle, because it's a very long subtitle. (laughs) It is. If it's it's not doing any work, you screwed up, because it does have a number of words in it. Yes. Um, So let's – now, I talked to your colleague at Cato, John Glazer, some time ago, and we got a little into kind of the libertarianism and foreign policy per se. In other words, why uh, libertarianism – might have a certain amount of com in common when it comes to foreign policy and national security, at least with, with some views you would find on the left. Correct. But we didn't do it systematically. So I, I, I want to address that a little more systematically with you, but I also want to get into contemporary issues okay. such as Donald Trump uh, and his, uh, there's some things he said during the campaign that you would agree with. I know. And there's, and for that matter, some things that some people on the left might agree with Lee and, 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 uh, We'll get into those and also into the okay. question of to what extent you think he's delivered, if at all. And we'll, we'll talk about other contemporary things, Iran, China. Okay. Uh, Sounds and, good. And, and Venezuela, maybe. Yeah. So, but let's take it from the top. I mean, you must be frustrated by this, uh, b- by the assumption. I mean, for example, right wing and hawkish have almost become synonymous in the realm of foreign policy, right? There is this assumption that is, that as you move to the right, and I, and I've done this myself, I've referred to right wing, uh, I've I've called hawkish policies right wing, and you would have jumped in to, to correct me probably, right? Not always. I mean, certainly, you know, it depends on who the president is and depends on who purports to speak for the conservative movement. But there have certainly been times in the history of the conservative movement when people have been hawkish and other times when they haven't. Uh, same as on the left, right? There are times when uh, some of the, you know, the, the uber hawks were on the left. Of course, the neoconservatives started out as, as liberals, right? They were Scoop Jackson liberals. So uh, it really depends on the frame of reference, depends on who you're talking about. Uh, the one thing that I think is consistent is libertarians have traditionally been uh, the most skeptical of warfare uh, for as long as I've studied them. Uh, and the reasons are pretty simple. It's because war is the health of the state. Uh, and so if you believe that, if you understand that, uh, then it, then then you can understand why libertarians have traditionally been very skeptical. Elaborate on that a little. Where does that phrase come from and what does it mean? Well, it initially was uh, from um, Randolph Bourne, who's a writer in the turn of the 20th century, a crit- great critic of the war in uh, World War I. Uh, but you also have people like James Madison, who says of all enemies of public liberty, war is perhaps the most to be dreaded. So this is not a new concept. This is an idea that's kicked around for a long time. You could even go back to, you know, war is the, the, the state made war and war made the state. That's James Scott. Uh, uh, so war, what does know, the hell the state mean? War brings power to the state. Correct. That's right. I mean, if you look at, and in some respects, of course, the, the origins of uh, states themselves, they were created to defend people from harm. And so you, you, you know, you stood up these organizations and all the way from you know, feudalism and the, the night on horseback, right? This is why they existed. That's why they grew up. But over time, as the state became more powerful, uh, it, precisely because it was uh, waging war, uh, then um, uh, then the the concern on the part of libertarians traditionally is that uh, those those purported foreign threats, the purported threats to to, uh, to security here at home, it becomes a vehicle for growing the power of the state, and that's what we've seen happen over and over again throughout our history. And in case there's anyone who was a little rusty on their definition of libertarianism, we we should say libertarians are. Conservatives who are, you might say, particularly skeptical 
of uh, the value of much state intervention in the economy. across the board, across, yeah, across the, board. the board, economy right. and right. and life. And in fact, on the lifestyle issues, again, this is a place we might see some convergence between libertarians and people on the left. So, for example, a lot of libertarians advocate drug uh, legalization. Correct. You know, lifestyle issues, things, you know, sexual orientation and so right. on. Um, you know, libertarians just don't like the government getting into your business. Right. And if you think about it, just using that example, if you look at occasions in American history where the most egregious uh, uh sort of intrusions into personal liberty occur. They occur during wartime, right? That's when we crack down on free speech. That's when we create uh, morality crusades against alcohol and prohibition is to defend the ability of the, of the, you know, the members of the, the, the men, the men of society to serve in the military. That was the justification. So some of the greatest examples of, uh, of the, of what we think of as individual liberty being encroached upon occur when, uh, when the case is being made to, to fight a war. Yeah. You know, I have a little anecdote you would appreciate, I think. Uh, as it happens, I was flying, like, within a couple of weeks of 9-11 or something. It was in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, and I was in an airport somewhere. And um, there was a security guard. It was one of those situations where you're deciding, like, which line to get in. Right. And these were – it was several different, I guess, security lines, but they weren't the kind that, like, snake around. They were just short lines with 10, 20 people coming directly out at you. There were maybe four or five to choose from. There was a guy who I don't even think was an, an actual police officer. I think he was like a, a, a sec private security guard. Okay. I don't even, I don't think he even, he maybe didn't have a gun. Okay. But he did something I had never seen these guys do before or anyone do at an airport. He was telling people which line to get in. And right. You know, this is a classic situation where you can totally leave this to the free market, right? I mean, people are very good at choosing the shortest line. We don't need yeah. someone. Yeah. But but honestly, I think that was an example of the fact that people in general with authority, it's human nature for them to prefer more than less. And, and if a situation arises that offers them more, they'll take it. And I think there was a sense right after 9-11 yes. that you can, if you've got a uniform on, man, you can tell people what to do and they will That's do right. it. Right. And there are other occasions where when we are in position, you know, during times of great crisis, during times of war, uh, people just by their nature become sort of quiescent. They agree. They, they tolerate certain things. Uh, and sometimes they even demand the government to do certain things that they would never demand or tolerate if we were at peacetime. Uh, and so that's been that's been my guiding principles from the very beginning. And I should mention, I mean, I'm, I'm not a pacifist. I served in the military. I served in the United States Navy. So, I, you know, it's not like I don't think there are there are occasions when the use of force is actually appropriate. But I just think those occasions are rare. Uh, and if we lose sight of the all of the costs that come with when we wage war, it's not just uh, in the dollars and cents and lives lost, but it's also the loss of liberty at home. Okay, so let's explore a little further the, la the libertarian rationale for a non-interventionist, relatively non-interventionist um, military policy. I want to eventually get to some ways in which I would contrast you with some also non-interventionist views on the left, because there are... You know, when you get into like global governance and stuff and, yep. and, and international security structures, or th there may there may be some differences. But for starters, um, OK, so you don't like the fact that war tends to expand state power. There's also the fact that it tends to interrupt uh, international commerce. Right. That's right. That's right. We believe in trade as a fundamental human right. At the Cato Institute, there are four core principles, individual, uh, limited, uh, individual liberty, limited government, free trade, and peace. Those four things go together, uh, and war is harmful to trade. Now, you, you'll hear many people make the case that the U.S. military presence around the world facilitates the flow of goods around the world. I'm dubious of that claim, and I think there are certainly uh, a number of occasions where it does the opposite. Right where the wars the United States has started or expanded or continued have actually disrupted trade. They've disrupted trade relations. They're disrupting trade relations right now as we speak. The power of the U.S. government uh, trying to dictate to other countries how uh, they should conduct their affairs uh, has resulted in uh, in this lack of trust and a declining trust, which is critical to a sustaining trade. Mm -hmm. Look, trade is beneficial uh, in the aggregate. I understand it's not always beneficial at an individual.
individual level. But in the aggregate, the evidence is overwhelming that one of the critical uh, features or the driving prosperity in the world of the last half century at least has been the reduction in barriers to trade, the tremendous uh, growth of prosperity, even among the poorest on the planet. Uh, and I think there's no question that that is mostly driven by uh, re reducing and in some cases eliminating arbitrary restrictions on the flow of goods and services. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, when it comes to alliance, I mean, one, one thing, you know, Trump has been kind of down on NATO. My, my, my sense is that um, in principle, libertarians are fine with alliance as an abstract principle. In other words, if there is a war to fight, Correct. you're all for burden sharing, which is one thing that alliance Correct. can accomplish. But, but I, I, I gather you are uh, skeptical, maybe somewhat in the way Trump is, of the, our current relationship to NATO. I'm skeptical not for the same reasons that, that President Trump is. President Trump seems to believe that if he merely if can figure out the, the appropriate price to charge for the services of the U.S. military, he's happy to sell it to anyone willing to pay. Uh, that troubles me deeply. Okay? <laughs> the notion that the U.S. military is actually out for hire. Right. And that's the part that really that really that I'm not on board with. Uh, I think if you look at the reason why NATO, for example, was created at the time when it was created, Western Europe was threatened by a common enemy. That is our common enemy, the Soviet Union. You had the Red Army lodged in Eastern Europe and Western Europe was in no position to defend itself. I even I could have defended that alliance. And that did go against uh, American founding traditions going back to, you know, uh, Washington warning against permanent alliances and Jefferson uh, warning against entangling alliances. There were exceptions, as you know. When there's a war going on and we have common security interests, we have allies that we can fight with. Uh, but we never revisited that basic bargain. When the countries of Europe in particular were capable of defending themselves, when the nature of the threat changed dramatically after the collapse of the Soviet Union, we never revisited that basic bargain. In fact, we expanded NATO. Uh, and became NATO became an end in itself. It wasn't merely a means to an end, but an end. And that's really where I think uh, uh, we've gone badly, uh, badly astray. Um, so, so there was uh, there was less skepticism, I guess, by a long shot of the American, the, the military alliance America was part of during the Cold War from yes. your perspective. Correct. And is that partly because of the ideological nature of the adversary? In other words, you sure. know, Soviet, the, the, the communist menace. I mean, those guys are the opposite of libertarian. That's right. Not libertarian. The opposite so, of libertarianism. So was that part of the driving? I, yes. I mean, in other words, if they had been like if they had been these capitalists who just had imperialist ambitions, like would that have been less of a problem? I think it would have been less of a problem. I don't think there's any question that ideologically communism is the opposite of libertarianism, that the whole notion of individual liberty and, the, and, and a small state is runs directly contrary to, to communism. I also think there was legitimate national security threat posed to the United States uh, by the Soviet Union, by a large, capable military, a large navy, ultimately nuclear weapons. Let's not forget those. So I think that on a case by case basis, you can come out. I can I can point to examples or moments in American history where alliances to defeat a, a, a genuine danger are, are worthy, where actual fighting a war to defeat an adversary is a, is a worthy goal. Uh, but I think we see this over the course of the, of the Cold War. We never really revisited our assumptions. We were locked into notions about uh, you know, self-determination always being uh, some, somehow filtered through the lens of, of the anti-communist fight. And, and that was where the Cold War really sort of got, went off the rails as far as I'm concerned. So we say that again. Where what part do you do not approve of? Well, like you know, Vietnam, for example, okay. de de declaring that uh, um, uh, genuine occasions of self determination or or a desire to throw off uh, throw off uh, foreign interference. Uh, that's that we always filtered that through the lens of the of the Cold War, and uh, and I think we've learned uh, that that was usually not the case. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, so there was a certain amount of threat exaggeration even yes. during the Cold War. Correct. And Vietnam is a good example. I mean, pe people really believed, some of them, that if, 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 if we lost Vietnam, it would be Central America would be the next place uh, they'd show up. The, um, so, and, and there, um, I mean, you know, John Mueller had an interesting argument that I guess you don't buy. Now, I know you co-edited co a volume with John. Right? Yeah, John, John's a colleague of mine, a friend. Yep. And and uh, when I was acting editor of the New Republic in, in 1989, I actually uh, ran a piece by him that I thought – 
was was pretty plausible. It got a certain amount of blowback, but he just pointed out that, like, you know, the Soviet Union, precisely because uh, communism is not a very productive economic system, it, yeah. all of its client states that were communist needed to be subsidized by the Soviet Union. That's right. So That's what right. John said was, look, if you want to drain the Soviet Union of power, let it keep amassing client states. <laughs> the beginning, give it more, give it more. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't totally, I, I mean, to me, it was, if nothing else, a reminder that you should only be so panicked by, by an empire that by its very nature drains resources from the center, which is what you're supposedly afraid of. Right. And, and I think related, it, it, there, were mo- there have certainly been moments in time where Americans forget what it is that actually makes us uh, strong, what actually ma- gives us power and influence, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and that for, for most of our history, it was the example that we set for the rest of the world. It was the fact that a lot of other countries wanted to emulate the United States of America. That's not to say that there weren't moments when U.S. military power was also critical, and I think that, that it's especially the case in World War II. But precisely because the, the Soviet Union had to cajole, bribe, and often threaten its allies, and then to in order to keep them in the fold, uh, that became a source of vulnerability for them, a source of weakness. And then we did the same thing. <laughs> and then we made deals with countries and regimes that undermined our values, that were contrary to what we were trying to emulate, and that ultimately did not redound either to the benefit of us from a security perspective perspective or to the cause of liberty in these places where from Iran to Guatemala to pick your place Indonesia where the United States was was trying to keep in power uh, a authoritarian illegitimate government against the wishes of its people uh, all in the name of fighting the Soviet Union that's where we lost sight of what this the whole purpose of these uh, relationships were in the first place well and in some of these cases that has come back to haunt us and haunts us to this day I mean in the case of right. Iran you know people ask why do their leaders always say death to America? Well, the reason that's a powerful rallying cry in Iran is partly because we deposed the democratically elected government in 1953, ushered in an era of brutal dictatorship. Correct. And that's what their own Islamist revolution was about in 1979, getting rid of this guy we had helped impose on them. And to Correct. this day, obviously, I mean, th- this is uh, this is with us. Yes. Uh, and I think... My colleague, uh, Ted Galen Carpenter and Malunas, several years ago, wrote a book called Perilous Partners, which was about our relationships with these authoritarian regimes. Ted just has a new book that's focused on U.S. relationship with various so-called freedom fighters around the world. Time and time again, American leaders convince themselves, whether it's the regime that we're trying to support or the or the groups trying to overthrow it. Time and again, we convince ourselves that they're our friends, they're our e- even that they're liberals, classical liberals, small L liberals, when many times we're, we're believing our own lies. And mm-hmm. I think we need to have a much more uh, careful approach to this. We need to be much more discriminating and discerning and, frankly, a little bit more skeptical when people come to us and say, good news, I'm here to, to, to uh, promote American values, American principles, uh, and, and looking past that they have very often self-interested motives uh, as well. So as long as we're talking about Iran, that's a good example of a contemporary issue uh, that you could weigh in on. I mean, well, what's your view of where we are on that probably not a very good place right no i mean i think that the iran nuclear deal the joint comprehensive plan of action was uh, a uh, the correct approach to dealing with the iranian nuclear program that was not a nuclear weapons program but certainly an indigenous nuclear enrichment program i believe that it was appropriate to try to figure out ways to convince the iranians that having such a program was not in their best interest one of the ways to do that was to put pressure on them economically which then compelled them to come to the negotiating table and make critical concessions uh, uh, both including uh, re- relinquishing mo- most of their enriched material, significantly restricting the enrichment activities, and uh, agreeing to forego uh, weapons and co- comply with the non-proliferation agreement and things like that, the nuclear non-proliferation treaty. In exchange, the United States and the other parties to the JCPOA uh, relaxed the sanctions. Uh, it was one of the one of several critical own goals on the part of the Trump administration to withdraw from that agreement. Uh, the Iranians were in compliance. All the other uh, parties to the agreement agreed that the Iranians were in compliance, but I think it's pretty clear that that, uh, President Trump's problem with Obama's nuclear deal with Iran was that it was Obama's deal and it was with Iran. 
uh, and he didn't really care about the particulars. The particulars were that Obama negotiated it and it was with the Iranians. Uh, so in that context, you would ask what exactly, in addition uh, to you know, the so-called better deal that the critics of the, of the JCPOA are always talking about, what exactly would that have entailed where they would have agreed that it was a good deal? I'm convinced there's nothing at all uh, because any deal at all with the Iranians would have been intolerable uh, to most of the people who were critics of the JCPOA. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you wanted uh, to keep them in the nuclear nonproliferation um, treaty. Uh, I think, by the way, there wasn't, um, well, we can get into that. But but, uh, the main thing I want to say is that brings us to the subject of um, international law, international treaties. And this is an area where there can be tension between libertarian foreign policy and a more uh, left-wing, non-interventionist foreign policy. Leftists are thought of as being on balance more enthusiastic about international law than libertarians. Um, so let's talk a little about that and about, you know, global governance and stuff. Now, you and I had a conversation not long ago. Sure. Um, no, it wasn't, wasn't recorded or anything. Right. But uh, where I was happy to find that um, you seemed appreciative of something that I think could use more respect, which is the fact that if we made a habit of complying with the part of international law that says you can't attack a country unless either they attack you or the United Nations Security Council authorizes you to attack them, right? Um, we'd have been better off. Like, for example, the Iraq War of 2003 wouldn't have happened and several other uh, things that arguably haven't gone that great wouldn't have happened. And you were, you seemed fine with emphasizing the importance, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the importance of respecting the Security Council's judgment. Am I? Yes. I mean, in some respects, this is the aspect of the United Nations that is more realist than normative and constructivist, right? That mm-hmm. is, the Security Council reflected at the time of its founding uh, more or less the power relationships of the day. Uh, it is less reflective of that reality 70 years, 70 plus years later. And yet, uh, by and large, if we were more respectful of sovereign equality, if we were more respectful of genuinely not violating other countries' borders by force, if we restricted those uh, uses of force to those rare occasions when you actually get unanimity, at least among the five permanent members, uh, then I think there would be far less war, and I think that would be good. There has been, by the way, far less war since 1945, and I think you have to give at least some shred of credit to the United Nations for that. I also think think that nuclear weapons and proliferating trade also factored in heavily. But Mm -hmm. on all of those grounds, I have no particular quarrel with the United Nations or, frankly, any other multilateral body that would help coordinate activities under the principle of sovereign equality. That is not simply a matter of uh, the strong do what they will, the weak suffer what they must. Mm -hmm. Now, you would be less enthusiastic about the United Nations uh, authorizing military intervention for the sake of, uh, you know, in the name of, uh, for humanitarian reasons, I guess. Yes. And on the left, I'd say there is growing skepticism of that, as we've seen how, what, how that can be used. So, for example, Libya starts as a humanitarian intervention. Yes. The U.S. arguably exceeds the U.N. mandate, but in any event, it turns into a, a massive bombing and regime change operation, and, and, and things are still not going well there, and Correct. so on. So, so that's kind of a conversation that's happening on the left. I think there's real division on the left, but for libertarians, I, I guess there's less division, right? It's it's like right. humani- internal humanitarian issues. I mean, there there is extreme respect for national sovereignty, pretty much across the board among libertarians, right? Right. Whatever you mean by extreme. Let me say this, that in those occasions when there are uh, there are gross human rights abuses occurring in a particular place, there is almost always a security threat to the neighboring states and to nearby states from refugee flows and from the, from the outflow of violence and things like that. So in many cases, I can justify humanitarian intervention, not on strictly humanitarian grounds, but on realist grounds. The problem is that if the United States is going to hold itself out as the billy club for every single dispute around the world and tell other countries to sort of stand down, then we really are on the hook to resolve all of these problems before they, you know, when they, when they prop up. And that's a 
problem, I think. That's, a, that's the power problem. That's my first book. But let me also say this. There are um, many Americans who give willingly to humanitarian relief organizations every single day. They do it through private charity and NGOs and things like that. And I think if you look at the work that has been done by private NGOs, you know, from the Gates Foundation to, to the Red Cross, in terms of helping alleviate human suffering, if you talk about humanitarian operations that are that are that are truly focused on alleviating suffering, I think most of the time there are there are vehicles for doing that that do not rely on the use of force. And so that's why I still come back to if you're going to if you're going to call on the U.S. military to go into a foreign place and to pry the guns out of the cold dead hands of the people that are using them, you've got to have a darn good reason, and you've got to have the support of the American people in order to sustain that mission over the long term. I think in many cases that's going to be really hard to. Okay, so if you were president, what would you do about Venezuela? Venezuela is a case where the United States role is actually, it could be, it should have been fairly minimal. We were one of several states in the hemisphere that cared what was going on in Venezuela. You had a humanitarian crisis. There is obviously a grow, you know, there is a, the erosion of individual liberty in this country. Again, from a libertarian perspective, I can look what's happened in Venezuela and be offended. Um, but that does not mean that the United States should have been picking and choosing, you know, who was going to be the leader of the next military government. We had several, there were several instances where you had military officers meeting with American officials in Washington, D.C., planning a coup. The, the Trump administration met with several opposition leaders. So the moment the United States starts engaging in that kind of behavior, it does two things. One, it undermines the legitimacy of the opposition in Venezuela, which was real, but is now tainted by its association with the United States. And secondly, it, 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 imposes or at least suggests that the U.S. the U.S. is actually going to be behind some change, which puts us on the hook if, if things go, go badly. And then people say, wait, wasn't the United States supposed to be here to rescue us from this danger that's 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 come to us uh, from a from an uprising that is that is genuinely domestic in nature? So, so you're against regime change, even when the when the regime is antithetical to libertarian values, as is the case in Venezuela. Foreign imposed regime change. That's the difference. And does, but, it, does that include the kinds of of um, democracy promotion stuff that we did in Ukraine, for example? Yes, uh, but let's be clear. Um, when the United States engages in democracy promotion um, and, and, again, is meeting with opposition figures, and when the U.S. government is doing it, then it's an, in, then it's an instrument of U.S. government policy. And then you ask the question, are these individuals genuinely representative of the wishes of the people that, of the country that they purport that they were trying to, to take over, uh, or are they doing it at the behest of Uncle Sam? Uh, the moment we start doing that, it really undermines the legit legitimacy. And, and I think we forget the many occasions over the course of, of the last several hundred years where where genuinely autocratic governments were overthrown by genuinely domestic movements. And what was the United States approach to that? To support, to give, to give verbal encouragement, to serve as the example. It worked extraordinarily well for most of our history. And then somewhere along the line, we decided that if we weren't putting our fingers on the scale, then liberty couldn't possibly win in those contests. I think that's just wrong. I think it's horribly short-sighted. Okay. Um, Let's move to another region. How about China? A good example of, of another government. It's actually, I would say, the Chinese government is in a way less antithetical to your values than a Venezuelan government in the sense that communism is really a misnomer for, for their economic philosophy in China, wouldn't you say? I mean, it is, it is a statist kind of capitalism that I know you don't approve of, but, but it always kind of annoys me when people keep <laughs> calling it communist. I mean, the party is called the Communist Party. Okay, it's right. It's not a communist okay. economic system. Right? All right, I get, fine. I get your point, Bob, but. It's a single party state, so this is yep. not a well. It's authoritarian in the country. There's no doubt about that. From a political perspective, and and let and let's please not confuse crony capitalism, state directed capitalism, from genuine genuine free market capitalism. Okay, and you see that the kind of again, you want to talk about putting the finger on the scale, the kind of behavior that the U that the Chinese government engages in to support privileged uh, industries to to from everything from loans to regulations that are that are inequitably applied in a way that advantages certain firms over others that's crony capitalism that's not capitalism so I only I, I chuckled a bit when you said the Chinese government is much better than the Venezuelan government I said you know that's that's sort of like well, this, uh, let's this, say this there's a bad camp sort of thing you know le less of the kind of redistrib redistributive economics that libertarians don't generally champion I just meant they aren't they they aren't socialist or communist the way the Venezuelan government could could 
but, fine. But, 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 but again, even from, and the main question is, what do you think we should do about China? Because, I mean, most of the arguments about China actually don't involve their internal behavior anyway. I mean, you hear some of that. And and I, I'm sure the fact that you can call them the Communist Party probably helps gin up opposition to China. But most of the actual arguments in foreign policy circles are about what they're doing in their neighborhood. Right. Right. Building these, you know, these islands. Uh, claiming some islands that are disputed. Yes. There's this Belt and Road Initiative where they go around doing deals with governments around the world where they loan them the money to do these big infrastructure projects. And so there's various things that I guess alarm people. I'm wondering uh, how many of them you think are good cause for alarm. Right. Well, let me start with Belt and Road. Uh, I, I, my interpretation of what's happening with, with, with Belt and Road is um, a, a, a huge surplus of uh, labor and capital and, and building material and know-how that the Chinese are, have, have applied internally, and now they have a surplus and they're trying to, to apply it externally. Uh, many of the projects that they're funding, both in Central Asia, into, into uh, uh, you know, even approaching Europe, into Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, things like that, um, they are marginal projects by definition, because if there were private actors and private lenders that saw them as a viable long-term mission, then they would have been funded by private support. So there's some, they're, they're less, you know, uh, uh, they're marginal. That's the whole, the whole definition, right? So they're, they're supporting them. Uh, maybe they're choosing to do so for geostrategic reasons. It's not always clear to me that that's the case. But even if they are, it's not, I'm not convinced that they're actually going to derive much geostrategic benefit from it anyway, even if that's their intention. So that's where I come down on that. In terms of the, what's happening in the South China Sea and the island building campaigns and things like that, uh, I think there, if you, if you want to sort of play this game, um, if, the South, if, if the Chinese see the South China Sea like the Caribbean, we, like we view the Caribbean, and for you know a good part of our history, at least the last 120 or so years, we viewed the Caribbean as an American lake, uh, and we didn't take kindly to, the, to others, you know, playing in our in our uh, uh, lake. Uh, then, then can you do, can you kind of equate Chinese behavior in the South China Sea uh, to that? Perhaps there's one enormous difference. Uh, with no disrespect to the Bahamians or the Jamaicans or anyone else who I have enormous respect for, and it's a great place to visit and things like that, there are real countries with real interests and real power who have claims to the same islands and the same shoals that the Chinese are claiming in the South China Sea. The difference is the United States has, has effectively discouraged these other countries from reaching an accommodation with the Chinese over these disputed territories and disputed islands and disputed shoals. Is that right? Have, have, yes. We, have we? Yes. And what that means as a, as a practical matter is by suggesting that the United States is going to treat the claims of any other country other than China as the legitimate claim to these territories has discouraged these other countries from reaching an accommodation. And I think that's, that's unfortunate because I do think there are in many cases, even in the cases of land which is a zero-sum game or, or fishing rights or things like that, you know, um, there are occasions where a, um, a negotiated settlement can deliver suitable benefits to, to both parties or all parties con contesting it. But, but for many American allies, believing that the United States is going to back their claims to the hilt has discouraged that kind of accommodation. So that's the main yeah. form of discouragement. I mean, I mean, it's not the case that Japan is like actually kind of pleading with us to let them. Uh, I mean, are, is there the expressed view in Japan that they'd really like to do more negotiating with China than we're? Uh, I think you're unlikely to hear hear J Japanese officials say that, and certainly in public. Uh, but I think we shouldn't ignore the moral hazard, right? And, and this mm -hmm. is, goes with all allies. When when you are when you have an alliance partner that is the United States of America, the biggest, baddest, most powerful country in the world, still in spite of our recent difficulties, um, then on what grounds would you make a concession or consider making concessions to others? In fact, you may even be emboldened to take reckless actions because you, you are confident that your big, strong, powerful ally is going to back you up if that, if that uh, goes badly. Uh, and I think that's, a, that's, that's happened in other cases. It's happened to a certain extent in East Asia as well. Yeah. Um, so would you be withdrawing troops and, and to some extent the naval presence um, from that region if you were a president? I think that, yeah, I told you I was in the Navy, and I think the, the ability of the U.S. Navy to go anywhere where there's water is a perfectly, a perfectly reasonable thing. I think the Chinese look at it differently. They say if the U.S. Navy was able to close off access to the South China Sea, which would effectively starve most of the ports through which our, our commerce flows, then that would be a security threat. And 
And if as long as the U.S. Navy is purporting to keep the seas open, that's all well and good. But the same power that allows the seas to be kept open can also be used to close them. Uh, and I think that's what that's part of what's motivating the Chinese to try to reassert control over that that body of water. OK, I mean, it seems to me push came to shove. It would be kind of a messy thing for us to get involved in. Right. I mean, I mean, they, they have a they have a they have a I'm military, you said that. Yeah. Have a military of growing strength. And they are a lot closer to that area than we are. Right. But this is, again, where other countries in the region have interests, have capabilities that should be in, in employed here. The, the notion that the United States is the only country in the world mm -hmm. that cares about these things is false. Uh, and frankly, we don't care about them as much as they do. Uh, and I think that's a perfectly reasonable standard, right, that 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 if the United States and this gets to your point about about troop deployments, I don't see the value of a troop deployment in many of these places any longer, uh, even in North Korea, even in the Korean Peninsula, where where the presence of the U.S. forces there isn't actually what prevents the North from invading the South. They're a tripwire force. Uh, that means the United States will be implicated in the event of a conventional attack by by the North against the South. Uh, but it's not like that. That military presence there is a essential to U.S. national security, or frankly, even, I don't really think it's as essential to South Korean security as people make it out to be, because the South Korean military is also quite capable. Mm -hmm. um, but to some extent, would the security of South Korea per se weigh in your, if you were president again, weigh in your decision as to how fast to withdraw and things like that? Sure. It's precisely for the reasons that they have grown dependent upon this this presence. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I think unwisely from our perspective as much as from theirs. So you don't unwind these things in a, in a fortnight, right? This is a conversation you have with, with empowered, capable allies who have legitimate security interests. When we started defending South Korea from North Korea, that was not the case. It was one of the most, de South Korea was one of the most desperately poor countries on the planet. Now it is one of the wealthiest. Their ability to defend themselves from danger is, is enormous. And they've also, of course, expanded dramatically their trade relations, including with China, North Korea's main patron. And so the Chinese have an interest in not seeing uh, the North invade the South as, al almost as much as the United States does. Mm -hmm. Okay. To get, to get briefly back to the Middle East, I assume you're uh, leaving aside, you know, conventional military interventions, the whole kind of drone strike thing where, I mean, it's two kinds of drone strikes. There's the military kind, which are at least a matter of public record. You can find out about them. And then there's the CIA drone strikes, which I guess we, am I right that we have no way of knowing how many countries they're even happening in because no. they're not, is that right? Yeah, no, not even members of Congress. No, you know, no, which no. when you think about it, I mean, come on, could we just dwell on this a little? I mean, yeah, our let's tax dwell on that, shall we? That's a good idea. I, mean, I know you make a living dwelling on this, but <laughs> our, our, can't any reasonable American agree that if my tax dollars are going to kill people, Yes. The killing of whom I have not approved of, I could at least get some information about it. Right. I mean, like what countries, how many countries are we right. doing it in? So this is, again, where I lay most of the blame on Congress. Congress has clear authority and responsibility, both under the Constitution and, and statutory, to review this this conduct, to, to uh, subject it to oversight. Some of that oversight will occur in closed session. I totally understand that. Some of the information is kept classified for a reason. Most of it is kept classified for not very good reasons, which is it's maybe embarrassing or things like that. Uh, the, uh, the, the willingness of members of Congress to defy the oath they take to the Constitution, to actually take seriously the ability to declare war and wage war, uh, is to me one of the most shameful episodes in the last 20 years. Uh, there are people who will be deploying to Afghanistan this year who were born after the passage of the 2001 AUMF. Um, the, the, that means that the vast majority of members of Congress have never even voted on an authorization to use military force, which even that isn't, of course, a declaration of war, which is their, their solemn obligation. We, the, the Congress has allowed the president to wage war at his discretion, wherever he feels like it. And, uh, and I think that, that, frankly, with the same kind of fervor that some people in this, in this country would go after a member of Congress, for example, for defying a pledge not to raise new taxes or, or not to cut certain spending on certain programs, where is the outrage when a member of Congress does not fulfill their basic constitutional obligation with respect to war and peace? Mm -hmm. So a lot of what we've heard are kind of, you know, in principle objections to militarism. Um, this is another one, actually, your, your belief that often 
It is at odds with the Constitution and the way the Constitution ordains that decisions about military intervention be made. We've just let go of the idea that Congress needs to declare war, even yes. though it's in the Constitution. Now, what about um, Madison, by the way, just my favorite. Madison called the quote, the clause of the Constitution that vested the war powers in the con- Congress as the most important in the entire document. And how did that fall by the wayside? I mean, we respected that. Up until, yeah. did, did we respect it more or less consistently, yes. consistently yeah. through World War II? Correct. So the, the difference is after World War II, the, the notion that you would maintain a large, active, forward deployed military. Uh, that took hold. Before that time, in order for the president to wage war, he actually had to make the case to the American people through the Congress to raise the funds and to, to raise the military to do it. After World War II, that military was extant. It was in his possession. And based, and then he t- completely flipped the, the logic on its head. Then he uses that military and he dares the Congress to cut off funding to forces in the field, which they're not going to do. Now, that doesn't mean that from time to time, Congress has, in fact, passed an authorization to use military force where they actually been compelled or chose to take a a position. But in the cases where they didn't chose to take a position or when they chose against and the president overruled them, as with President Clinton overruled the Congress and waged war in Bosnia, for example, over the objections of of the of the Congress, uh, that the president has just usurped this authority and the Congress has basically let them. And are there any signs that that is going to be that trend is going to be reversed? With the exception of a few, I think, principled voices in the House and Senate, I would talk about Bernie Sanders, Mike Lee, Rand Paul in the Senate, uh, Chris Murphy on the House side. You have Ro Khanna, uh, Justin Amash, people like that. Ro, Ro Khanna is a very interesting new voice. In yes, general. he is. I, I mean, I'm wondering, he's from Silicon Valley. Does he, in foreign policy, represent the views of his constituents? I mean, I hope so. Well, I hope so. <laughs> I hope I hope so. And I, I mean, let's let's be clear. Uh, you're right. Ro, Ro is a very interesting voice in foreign policy, and he's one of the few members of Congress who I've heard use the term restraint and understand what it means. He quotes approvingly from John Quincy Adams, who said, don't go abroad in search of monsters to destroy. So, th- you know, there are people, there are a rare number of folks like that. And when they step out, I, I, I they get my attention. Uh, but I think that, look, broadly speaking, the American people are tired of war. That is something that President Trump actually capitalized on against uh, Hillary Clinton, right? You know, blaming her for the wars that have been fought over the last 20 years and claiming he was going to stop them. Yeah. So I don't see in the American uh, electorate this groundswell of, of, of call for more military intervention. I see the opposite. So what strikes, what's striking to me is there aren't more Ro Khanna's reflecting the wishes of their, their constituents. Again, this is where the elite uh, versus, uh, you know, uh, uh, grassroots divide remains fairly wide. I mean, one reason I find Ro Khanna so interesting is there are some people in Silicon Valley who make money off of Pentagon contracts, right? There are some cool. companies there that make a lot of money, and that's one reason it's uh it's interesting to me sure. but um the the um so uh let's talk a little more about the the kind of international law global governance side of things we we mentioned the non proliferation treaty <clears throat> so i gather you're fine with i mean in general i i think libertarians are in principle if you can convince them that laissez faire will not solve a problem, like in the realm of domestic economics, that would be when there are negative externalities of a right. sufficient order. You, you can see a case for uh, a non market solution that may include government regulation. Right. There, in, a, in a domestic market, you also have torts, right? You can use torts to deal with okay. externalities, and that's a way that we would do it in the, in the domestic market. There are some recourse for that in the international system, but less so. Yeah, and of course, a, a leftist might argue that torts tend to favor people with a lot of money. Uh, that 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 the, you know, people who can afford good lawyers tend to do better in that uh, in that system. But but the we, but the principle remains that if you are if there is an externality and if you can show that externality, yeah. there are ways to to capture that. And at least again, the goal is to impose costs on those who would do harm to others by their actions, by their negligence and things like that. We have a recourse to that in the domestic uh, in, in the domestic setting. Right. And in fact, we have seen in some areas uh, the functional equivalent of government regulation happens as a result of like class action lawsuits and things. Correct. Yeah. Um, the, so in the, in the, in the international context, the rough equivalent would be things like, uh, you know, if you believe that, that 
ongoing nuclear arms proliferation is re- is ultimately a problem for everyone. Uh, and, and you know, w- both because it increases the chances of nuclear war, whose consequences are hard to confine to the actual actors, and right. because it makes nuclear weapons potentially available to terrorists, then there's an argument for, like, doing a treaty, right? And, and you're... Yes. You're fine with that? Right. I have no particular problem with that. I will say, again, we mentioned John Mueller a few minutes ago, my colleague at Cato and also at Ohio State. John's written a lot about nuclear weapons and nuclear proliferation. He thinks a lot of the fear about nuclear weapons is overblown. I'm not entirely bought into that, but I do agree with him that that we should not use nuclear nonproliferation as an excuse to wage war to denude countries of their nuclear weapons, which has, of course, been the rationale on a number of occasions, and I could see it being a rationale in the future. So again, in the whole principle of trying to limit the number of occasions in which people could justify the use of force, I wouldn't like to see it used to, to deal with non, to prevent proliferation of nuclear weapons. To your point, it's better that it be done through a, through a multilateral treaty which has broad purchase, right? There are many people who are bought into the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Most countries have chosen to abide by it. There are very few exceptions. I think that's a good sign. I think that's good evidence that there is a possibility to achieve an agreement without, uh, you know, without the use of force, to achieve an agreement to, you know, reluctance to develop nuclear weapons. Now, our emphasis on that is inconsistent, of course. And, uh, you know, for example, I mean, Israel, India, Pakistan, they have chosen not to be part of the NPT. They have nuclear weapons, right. and we don't complain about that. Right. Whereas Iran is a member and is complying with the NPT. And in fact, to make damn sure they do, we had a, an extremely uh, intrusive inspection regime, and Trump just kind of abandoned all that. So uh, obviously we are not um, – I mean, I would say it's been a very long time. I, 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 I don't know that we've ever had an American administration that really wanted to put across the board consistent emphasis on the NPT, but we certainly haven't um, had one lately. Well, I mean, the Obama administration, when the Obama administration negotiated the JCPOA, it was clearly within the context of the NPT. In fact, oh, the, sure. one of the very first lines of the JCPOA is that the Iranians agree to comply with the NPT. What? So, so yeah. Yeah. What I mean is they weren't demanding that Israel, India, and Pakistan disarm. No, I mean, right. I mean one of the one one thing that John Kerry said that I really respected because people never say this is he said you understand you have to understand unless you're going to totally disregard international law, our bargaining position was actually not all that strong because <laughs> under the NPT, Iran right. has the right yes. to withdraw and. And, uh, and to they, enrich. They have, they have the right to enrichment. Now, part right. of the reason why the argument is, and I think there's a legitimate argument here, is they, 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 were, they subjected themselves to additional scrutiny because they were caught cheating on the NPT in the early 2000s. So there's, that was the argument why they had to agree, for example, to the additional protocol, things like that. Yeah. So what I mean is, if, if the Obama administration is going to act, as they did, as if it would be a huge scandal and, and an unacceptable outcome, for Iran to withdraw from the treaty and uh, and and make nuclear weapons, consistent consistency might suggest that they would be a little more upset about the fact that several of their allies do this and they don't say anything. That, that's the only point I was making. Of course, they would say, "Well, Iran is uniquely menacing." I mean, I'm not sure personally how sanguine <laughs> we should be about the fact that India and Pakistan uh, right. both have nuclear weapons and don't like each other. But um, but. Uh, but in any event, I, I, I digress. I mean, to, to, to get more into the libertarian position on this stuff, let's take an extreme case. Because kind of a hobby horse of mine is the idea that if you look at where certain weapons technologies are headed and how hard it actually is to control them, we're going to have to think about uh, governance in a new way and think about global governance in an ambitious way. So let's take biological weapons. Okay. Super hard super hard to control and regulate. There are all kinds of laboratories in America where they could be doing very nefarious stuff in principle. Right. And not to mention the fact that all these countries could be doing it. And and with genetic engineering uh, developing, you could well develop a designer bug that would wipe out millions of people in America. And you could be developing it in any laboratory anywhere, and it wouldn't be hard to deploy if it's sufficiently contagious and lethal now. Well, no, okay, but hold on a second. That's where you, you're, the whole deployment part is where it gets tricky, right? Because unleashing such a super bug um, 
how do you control it in such a way that that technology does not blow back on you? And again, this is, Mm -hmm. so it separates sort of, you know, state directed or sort of with a purpose, right. As -hmm. opposed to just merely as a terrorist act or an act of of mass violence. But that's typically why bioweapons have been not particularly popular, frankly, is because it's difficult to weaponize them and it's difficult, difficult to know that they're not ultimately going to blow back on you. Yeah. I'm not sure it's impossible. I mean, first of all, I assume that, uh, Eventually, genetic engineering will get to a point where it's in principle like a software virus where you could put a, a, an expiration date on it, hmm. let it, let it run loose in a country for a while. You can also, in principle, this is as creepy as, <clears throat> as they come, but you can divine, uh, uh, design ethnicity specific bugs. Mm-hmm. Sure. And, and, um, so I, I think there's cause for concern, not to mention the, I mean, I do think, it, uh, uh, we we tend to exaggerate the threat of a truly crazy suicidal person doing. They turn out not to be. You know, there's a reason there actually aren't that many suicide bombers in the world, and there's a reason. <laughs> and there's a reason that virtually none of the people who deploy them are themselves enthusiastic about dying. There's just you know I think we exaggerate that. On the other hand, with bioweapons or with nuclear weapons, even I mean it only takes one. Um, suicidal person anyway my if you let's just stipulate my premise which you may disagree with but if it were the case that in order to secure the the security of the planet including our nation going forward given various technological developments um you would have to have a treaty that um subjected the u.s to intrusive inspections Mm -hmm. or various kinds of laws like it might be illegal to uh, have certain kinds of lab equipment if they didn't have monitoring devices on them that reported what they were doing in real time to the cloud or something. Who knows? Right. Maybe an inspection, intrusive inspections of the kind Iran uh, puts right. up with or, or monitoring. In principle, could you live with that? If yes. You, you yeah, could. I don't really – yeah, I don't have a problem with that for the reasons that you just sketched out. I, I think – This is the key to remember in terms of my approach to foreign policy and why I'm a libertarian first, but I'm also I see libertarian foreign policy as conducive to American security. I believe that the United States is extraordinarily safe and secure, not primarily because of the way that our military behaves or what our military does, but because we have a culture worth emulating. We trade with the rest of the world, and that's been the the vehicle for for expanding U.S. influence for most of our history. That. I think uh, aligns with libertarian principles. I'd believe in them if, even if it wasn't the case, but the context right now is, is in that direction. Can you create a, a context in the future as we had in the past? For example, I would have supported U.S. intervention in World War II probably along the lines of when we intervened in World War II. Let's remember the United States was a co-belligerent long before the attack on Pearl Harbor. So I can come up with a moments in American history where there was a legitimate case to be made for collective action and treaties and things like that. I just think most most of the time, the, 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 the kind of behavior we engage in today is not actually it, – it's not that it's not convinced, consistent with libertarianism. It doesn't make us safer. It doesn't make us more prosperous. It's just, frankly, stupid. Okay, so you're, you're fine with using international law and developing international law in order to address genuine collective action problems among nations where the very sovereignty in a certain sense of the nation is threatened if they don't address them. Uh, yes. via collective action. Yes. The, the, I assume you're more skeptical of things like the International uh, Court of Justice. Yeah, I'll be honest. I have not dug into that that much. I'm not a lawyer. It's just sort of a little bit out of my area of expertise. I think a lot of the objections to the ICJ seems to strike me as a little bit weird, uh, but, I, but I'll be honest. I haven't but really I think one practical that. problem is sometimes it makes it hard to convince dictators to step down peacefully in some kind of negotiation. Yeah, but that, again, there are ways you can – yeah. that's true. I've heard that, but there are ways you can mitigate that mm-hmm. danger too. And then, uh, as we've said, you're, 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 you're not so enthusiastic about – International law of a kind that that uh, that that authorizes humanitarian uh, intervention or uh, or intervention. Again, you could cre- under certain under a certain reading of some of the modifications that have been made to the UN Charter that allow for the use of force. You're expanding the number of occasions in which the use of force, partly for humanitarian reasons, which you note, and that troubles me. I think in most cases that that sort of loosening of the restrictions on on the use of force is, is not ultimately uh, to our to our uh, mm-hmm. advantage. And that has been a change. I mean, the, this idea, yeah. the responsibility to protect 
is is has I don't I, I'm not clear to what extent it's become a real doctrine, but the idea or, or how formally it's enshrined. It, it was. It still requires a UN Security Council vote, but it, it sort of allowed for a, a, an additional set of circumstances in which the members of the UN Security Council might vote to authorize. And uh, and we saw again, it wasn't formally invoked in the case of Libya, but all the all the sort of you know the, mm-hmm. the all the rational the underlying rationales were consistent with the responsibility. Protect. And we saw how, how that played out. It played out very badly, played out very badly for the people of Libya, frankly, but it also played out badly for the people in the region. And their responsibility to protect refers to the responsibility of the leaders in the country to protect their people. And if they're failing to protect their right. own people, the idea is then, um, then the Brown intervention is justified for intervening. OK, yeah. so I think that's um, in terms of the international law part, I think that's it's fairly clear. Um, where you draw the lines. This is not unrelated to the question of like, you get accused of being um, an isolationist, I assume. Sure. All the time. And what do you say? <laughs> I say that if you really understood you, uh, the libertarian approach to uh, engaging with the rest of the world, it is, pre- it is precisely that, engaging with the rest of the world. My right to trade with others, to buy and sell goods, to travel, to host students in my home, that's all part of my fundamental right as a human being. That's all a form of engagement. Isolationism means truly sort of isolating yourself from the rest of the world. I think it's foolish. I think it's stupid. I think ultimately it wouldn't make for a better society here in the United States. I'm glad that the United States has, for most of our history, been welcoming of, of people coming here, wanting to build a little better life for themselves. I think we've been med- made better by trade. Uh, so I think uh, genuine isolationism in those senses is not only it's not p- practical, but it also uh, is not is not wise. OK. Um, and I guess final question. So can I just say, actually, let me let me add one quick point to this. Sure. Part. Is it. Precisely because we have defined American global engagement in military terms, if I am skeptical of the use of the military, that somehow makes me an isolationist. I think that's absurd. And, and that's, I mean, that's how I would answer that question. It's like, I've already stipulated that I'm not a pacifist. I'm not opposed to the use of force on all occasions, but to equate skepticism of American military intervention with isolationism, that to me is, 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 it's a slur. It's used right. to shut down uh, reasonable skepticism about the use of force. When did that become a slur? World War II or what? It was mostly deployed after World War II. You see some hints of it in terms of the anti-imperialist opposing U.S. involvement in the Spanish-American War, but it really only came into into wide usage uh, after World War II. And again, it was always intended as a slur. I know very, very few people who would proudly call themselves an isolationist uh, because they understand that it has mm-hmm. it has a very negative connotation. And then American first came to have negative connotations because of the specific people who are calling themselves American firsters before we're right. Is that right? Yeah, right. Absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, um, because I mean, it's funny. The reaction against Trump has been so full throated and, and um, that, I mean, one, you know, people yell, scream at him for the very idea of, 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 of putting America first. Right. And what's weird is I'm like this left of center global governance fanatic. <laughs> and I don't object to that so much per se, because I mean, if you just set aside its historical resonance, yes. the arguments I'm making for global governance are about national security. The, right. And, but, and, right. But the, but the fiction that he, the reason why him invoking this notion that the United States would actually care about its interests more than it cared about others' interests cut so against the argument of the establishment foreign policy, which is that, that we actually didn't privilege our interests over that of others. I think that's absurd. I think we always do and we always did or virtually always did. Yeah. So so this is what was so upsetting to to those who he and he was he was sort of bipartisan critic. He criti- bo- criticized both Republicans and Democrats for that. Uh, but again, the 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 amount of sort of um, ham-fistedness of, of his approach, the the lack of historical memory, uh, it's sort of not even aware that this this phrase was so uh, fraught. Uh, I, I think it reveals uh, that that while there are certain moments where he has a legitimate criticism, uh, it's not ultimately grounded in uh, in a deep understanding of U.S. foreign policy or how we should conduct ourselves going forward. 
No, I think deep understanding is something we can rule out. The um, no, it's amazing. It's amazing. The world hasn't gone up in flames already. There's like a new, there's like a new thing every week. I mean, the Mexican. Don't get me started talking about the Mexico right. terrorists. One, you mentioned imperialism. That reminded me. I wanted to ask you: Do you think that's an accurate characterization? Of, this is this is very common on the left to characterize America's militaristic foreign policy as being part of imperialism. Would you use that word? Well, sometimes I would, and I've I've. I've mostly been motivated to use it when people have celebrated American imperialism. That's what really sets me off. And so right after, right after Iraq, you may not recall, but I was, this is when I first started at Cato back in 2003, 2004. You had a handful of folks saying, look, Iraq is just the first move. We're going to, we're going to bring civilization to the countries of the Middle East and beyond in the same way that the British Empire brought uh, civilization to sub-Saharan Africa and the subcontinent places like that. And I said, no. Uh, that's not what the United States does. That's not what we should do. It ignores the whole concept of self-determination and human rights and individual liberty. Uh, and so that's really what motivates me. I also think, if, and my book does talk about the history of how the United States could have got involved, uh, especially around the time of the Spanish-American War. Uh, it's also true that America's imperialism was also, was always more constrained. It was, there was always competing elements sort of pushing back against it. I think that's the libertarian uh, element that within our society, going back to our founding, that was always pushing back against the notion that the United States, the purpose of the United States was to promote liberty by force. Uh, I think many times that was not uh, t- truly the case. Okay, so this really is the final question. The, um, uh, you know, you've made the case that, especially since the Cold War, uh, being of a militaristic bent is, is inconsistent and an interventionist bent is inconsistent with being a libertarian. So, so I gather the people, I mean, there are examples of libertarian hawks since the Cold War. I'm thinking of Glenn Reynolds of Instapundit, but okay. they are, though, they are true outliers just as a, uh, in the libertarian community. I can only speak to my colleagues here at Cato. I've been here for 16 years. My colleague Ted Carpenter has been here for 30. Um, and if you look at our body of work, uh, we have been consistently most skeptical of the use of force. We've been consistently skeptical of the wars from Iraq to Afghanistan. Uh, the original invention was fine, but subsequent to that. So I think if you look at our work, uh, we're pretty consistent. That's not to say there aren't people who call themselves libertarians who from time to time, on a case-by-case basis, they can make the, the case for war in particular. And then we debate amongst ourselves why their case for war uh, holds up or doesn't hold up. Okay. So thank you so much for taking the time. The name of the book is thank Peace, you, War, and Liberty. Earlier you wrote The Power Problem. And uh, any other books you want to mention? You've written several. Uh, well, you mentioned the book that I co-edited with John Mueller, which is A Dangerous World, Threat Perception in U.S. National Security. So, so you know, I think if you look at – so The Peace, War, and Liberty is the most recent book that I have, uh, again, grounded in libertarian principles, and, and uh, I think that's the one that's most up-to-date in terms of my mm-hmm. thinking. Uh, my colleague, John Glazer, who you did interview a few weeks ago, and my colleague, Trevor Thrall, and I, we have a new book coming out in the fall. Uh, I guess we can talk about – well, you got Trevor Thrall on there and talk about the book when, when it comes out in October. What's, it, what's the name of the book? It's called Fuel to the Fire, How Donald Trump uh, took our broken foreign poli- Made Our Broken Foreign Policy Even Worse. It's, so it's about uh, blowback in this. Yeah, it, it really it kind of pushed backs against the argument that the only alternative to Trumpism is what went before. And there were problems about what with what went before. There is a there is a third way. We need to find that third way. OK. And uh, where can people find you on Twitter? What's your Twitter handle? My Twitter handle is at C.A. Preble, P.R.E.B.L.E. Uh, and I'm at the Cato website, and all of my material is uh, freely accessible. Peace, War, and Liberty, by the way, I probably shouldn't say this, but Peace, War, and Liberty can be accessed at libertarianism.org. Basically, people can can view it, download it, things like that. Okay, and I am at Robert Ryder on Twitter, W-R-I-G-H-T-E-R. And this is The Right Show. Thanks so much, Chris. This was a great conversation. Thank you, Bob. Thank you very much.